Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions. Question one, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take in response to the oil and gas summit in Aberdeen on the 2nd of February 2015. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, the First Minister led the Scottish Government's involvement at yesterday's Aberdeen Oil and Gas Summit, where industry leaders, academics, trade unions, representative bodies and three layers of government came together to discuss the future of the industry and the region. The Scottish Government has acted decisively and swiftly using our devolved powers to support the oil and gas industry, for example, to establish a jobs task force to play our part in maintaining skills and employment and helping those who might be facing redundancy. We will continue to press the UK Government to make the urgent and substantial tax changes required to sustain investment and the long-term future of the North Sea, and I hope Mr Johnson supports our proposed changes. We are also supportive of the prospect of a city deal for Aberdeen and will liaise with the UK Government, Aberdeen City and Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire Council on this matter. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for his answer and I am sure that the industry will welcome the opportunity to see Scotland's two governments working together for the benefit of the industry. But given the longer term significance of the potential downturn, will the Minister commit the Government to improving confidence in the North East by ensuring that in future a higher proportion of locally generated resource is reinvested in the economic growth and invigoration of the North East? Minister. Well, of course, we want to work and continue to work closely with uh, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire councils. Uh, and uh, that is something that the First Minister emphasised at what I think was a very constructive meeting um, yesterday, Presiding Officer. And I'm also pleased that the task force led by Lena Wilson, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, came up with a large number of practical suggestions. And I know that Lena Wilson is absolutely determined personally to drive these forward, working closely with the Scottish Government. So, I mean, I'm happy to share the sentiments that Mr Johnson has set out, but I do think it's fair to say that the priority of the industry very clearly now is that the tax changes which are uh, expected on the 18th of March must be substantial, presiding officer, and that is the number one priority, I believe, for us all at this time. Alex Johnson. I share the Minister's uh, enthusiasm for the tax changes that he's mentioned. But as we go forward, uh, Aberdeen is known well uh, as Aberdeen's, uh, as uh, Europe's oil capital. But we have the opportunity to consolidate Aberdeen's position as Europe's energy capital. Will the Minister give a commitment at this stage to ensure that as we go forward, efforts will be made to concentrate uh, energy-related activities within Aberdeen to recognise the work that is done not only in uh, the offshore industry, but the potential onshore oil and gas industry in hydrogen technology and in renewables? Minister? Well, well I certainly agree that, that uh, Aberdeen, as well as being the centre of oil and gas activity for the UKCS is also an international hub from which, presiding officer, projects, uh, particularly in the, broadly the same time zone extending down to South Africa, are managed from Aberdeen. And just last year, the, uh, the income from international supply chain activity in oil and gas actually exceeded the, the amount from, generated from UKCS and west of Shetland activity at just over £10,000 million. I also agree with Mr Johnson's uh, a, a point that we should continue to look at other energy opportunities such as uh, renewables and also seek to work with uh, Colin Parker and others in Aberdeen Harbour in order to work through uh, uh, and generate the improvements to the harbour and the possible extension down to Nick. And I discussed these with, with Colin when I met him last week. In all of these respects, we have a lot of work to do, presiding officer, uh, and I hope that, that these points would be widely shared uh, by those. Finally, with regard to onshore activity, I made our position clear about the work that needs to be done, the, the basis for a moratorium pending further studies being obtained, uh, and also a public consultation, which I think is right, given our assumption of responsibilities for these matters. And I think I made all of that crystal clear last week. 
Uh, does the Minister agree with uh, uh, our, the members of the award-winning Chamber of Commerce, the Abilene and Grampian Chamber of Commerce uh, members? The members said uh, that they believe that the supplementary charge, which was introduced as the 2011 budget, must be abolished. Minister. Well, I had the opportunity of speaking to Bob Collier of, uh, of uh, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber. I'm delighted that he is uh, one of the members on Lena Wilson's task force, presiding officer, so that the excellent work that the chambers do, for example, in mentoring, can be brought to bear to meet the significant challenge that lies ahead now in assisting those who have been made or may face redundancy over the coming uh, months and the next year or so can get the maximum possible help. Uh, but to respond to the question about the supplementary charge, yes, we do think that the supplementary charge hike of 12% in 2011 should be reversed. We set that out, presenting officer, in this paper which I presented to Parliament on the 8th of January. Uh, and the reason why it's so important is not because there are necessarily profits being made at the moment. From my meetings with uh, many operators over the past three weeks, uh, many operators in Aberdeen, there are generally not profits being made at the moment. The real significance is to reinstill confidence in boardrooms throughout the world. And I cannot emphasize highly enough, having had a series of private discussions, that investment has already leaked on a very, very substantial scale and since 2011. And we're not talking tens of millions or even hundreds of millions. We are talking about billions of pounds of investment already having gone from the UK because of the damaging tax hike in 2011. This is an opportunity for the UK now to send a very clear signal, and I think that that opportunity is one that almost everybody that I've spoken to wishes to grab. Lewis MacDonald. Much I heard this morning from a constituent currently working in Houston who said that there needs to be some kind of emergency response system in place to deal with dramatic ups and downs in the oil industry and their impact on the economy of Aberdeen and the North East. Does the Minister agree with that? Will the Scottish Government play its part in such an emergency response system uh, and are we any closer to such a development following yesterday's summit? Minister? Well, the, I, as I outlined in the PACE debate last week, of course we already have the capability of through the employability fund and through European structural funds to assist people who are affected by the downturn in a number of ways across the whole country. For example, in East Ayrshire, uh, or I was speaking to Mr Campbell in RAF Lucas in Fife presiding officer, as you well know, there are many parts of Scotland that face shocks uh, and there are already provisions, as I argued last week, I think in the PACE debate, uh, to deal with that. Uh, that is why we have set up the task force and that is why I was extremely pleased to receive already a report in principle about the actions which are going to be taken. For example, better to promote and highlight through the industry the major PACE meeting that will be arranged in March to promote the employability helpline of the PACE team which is available for those who are affected and above all to gain from uh, the ideas which were presented by industry, by trade unions and academics at the, uh, at the task force and the summit meeting yesterday, both of them, in order to provide a whole range of different supports for each individual presiding officer. That is the goal and it is one that we will work to achieve together with all other parties and everybody else. Alice McInnes. Thank you very much. One of the elements agreed yesterday was that the North East needs proper support and investment in order to make it an attractive place for future business. At present, Aberdeen City Council is shortchanged on the local government funding formula by £13 million compared to the government's supposed funding floor. Will the Minister support a change to local government allocations to bring Aberdeen City up to a minimum funding floor and allow investment to make the city be a vibrant place for business? Minister. Well, I think it is correct to point out that, that we have been the first uh, uh, administration to place a floor on the amount of funding that is available. And that is something that, uh, although Alison McInnes is protesting audibly uh, from a sedentary position, uh, was not put in place when the previous administration were there. I think that is a matter of fact. But, of course, we face difficult times now. And I don't think it's really going to advance us to have a partisan approach about that. Order! And that is why... Mr MacDonald! And Mr Swinney. Um, 
That is why, presiding officer, I always seek to ride above expressions of partisan opinion <laughs> from whatever source they may, they may emerge, no matter how unlikely. Thank you. Question number two, John Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the recent Celtic versus Rangers match had on police resources. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, police Scotland put in place over 1,000 extra officers across Scotland to help manage this game. Over 600 in and around the stadium and over 400 in towns and cities across the country. This was a coordinated response from Police Scotland with officers readily available to manage fans. This included spotter teams uh, who worked jointly with partners from out with Scotland to target high-risk fans who may have travelled to Scotland for the game. British Transport Police, the Football Coordination Unit, also played an important role. It was disappointing to see that a small minority of the 50,000 football fans were intent on causing violence and disorder. At this stage, 56 people have been reported to the Crown by Police Scotland for football-related offences. Uh, we must recognise that these individuals are not representative of the positive attitude and behaviour of the vast majority of Scottish football fans and those who attended Sunday's game. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I mean, is he able to say if any of these 56, uh, any of their behaviour was linked to uh, sectarian behaviour, anti-Irish or anti-Catholic behaviour? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can uh, advise the member that of the uh, 56 people who have been reported uh, by the police to the Crown, uh, nine uh, were for offences under Section 1 of the Offensive uh, Behaviour uh, Football uh, Act. Uh, there are obviously a number of other offences, and the Crown will obviously be considering them as they go forward. However, it's entirely a matter for the Crown and how they choose to proceed with these particular individuals. Mr Mason. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that as well. I mean, it has been suggested that uh, alcohol should be more freely available at football games, and I wonder if he feels that alcohol did make the situation worse on Sunday, and if more alcohol would really help the situation. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, as I've said uh, previously, uh, the, whole, the importance of a football match is to make sure that it's an environment which people feel, feel safe uh, and that they also feel it's an environment which they uh, can bring their children and family to um, as well. So it's important that these factors are all taken into considering how we uh, manage football events. And as a government, we want to see uh, our national game to be seen as a positive thing which people can go along and uh, enjoy. Uh, I've stated uh, previously, if there was any issue around the uh, possibility of uh, introducing alcohol into uh, football um, again, uh, that would be a matter which would have to be uh, widely consulted on because it goes way beyond just of that what happens in the stadium itself. Um, and it is really a matter for the football authorities to uh, come forward with proposals on that, if that is what they uh, would like to see happening. But I am uh, very clear uh, the approach that was taken by Police Scotland on uh, Sunday, and I uh, joined them for the, uh, as an observer for uh, the uh, policing operation at the game, uh, was an approach that I believe uh, just demonstrated the level of professionalism uh, that we have within uh, Police Scotland and how you can manage such major events uh, uh, so extremely well. McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. The Commission's report in, into sectarianism, Dr Duncan Morrow, made a number of recommendations for football clubs and governing bodies for us to act upon. Can the Cabinet Sec Secretary inform me if he has met with any of the clubs or go governing bodies to discuss the implementation of these recommendations? I am not sure it had anything to do with the recent Celtic Rangers match, and I do not know if you wish to respond to Cabinet Secretary. Well, it may be if it uh, assists a member is that my colleague Paul Wheelhouse takes forward this area of policy and she may wish to write to him about these particular matters. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary, for your answers. I just wonder if you would agree with me, Cabinet Secretary, if we're ever going to get football to move into the real world in this country in terms of the challenges it faces, the only way we're going to be able to achieve that is to make sure we've got much more family involvement. Would he agree with me that it's time that the football authorities woke up smelt the coffee and introduce summer football to get more families into the game. I'm not sure it's got anything to do with uh, police resources, but if you want to answer it, Mr uh, Cabinet Secretary. I should say, President Officer, I don't think my powers go as far as directing Scottish football to have uh, football during the uh, summer, but as someone who is a regular attender of football matches uh, with uh, 
with my children. I think um, having them on uh, Saturday afternoons where the temperature is a bit warmer uh, would be much more attractive uh, to anyone taking their family members uh, along to uh, the football. But I'm always, uh, uh, you know, my view in terms of Scottish football is that um, uh, it's for the football authorities to make sure that it's not just an attractive product that's on the pitch, but also off the pitch. Uh, and other countries in Europe have been very successful in achieving that. And I do believe there is a challenge there to the Scottish football authorities to make sure that we achieve that off the pitch as well, uh, to make sure that we create the right type of environment for fans, that they are seen as being valuable and that they give them the type of resources and support that are necessary to make sure that the football environment for fans in Scotland is a first-class one. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just point out to members that um, when I call you for a supplementary, you're meant to address the question that was originally asked. Um, I don't mind um, when you're very, very clever and you link it to something else, but I've got to say um, that degree of uh, cleverness was not on display today. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12220 in the name of Marco Biaggi on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill.